Hello and welcome to my talk on Sequence Slam, visual route based navigation for sunny summer days and stormy winter nights. This is work or research I've performed with my collaborator, Professor Gordon Wyeth, and we are both at the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, sunny Australia. And this work was supported by an Australian Research Council Fellowship to myself. This video provides some motivation to the problem that we are trying to address in this work. What you are seeing here is phasing in and out between two different traverses of the exact same route along a road in Brisbane, Australia. One of the traverses was performed or driven during the middle of the day where the sun was out and everything was bright. The second traverse was driven in the middle of the night during a very heavy thunderstorm that we get in Australia. In both cases, we're filming through the windshield and you can see the rain all over the, all over the windshield, uh, making it very hard to see outside. Now, the main point from this video is that the two sets of conditions make the environment look extremely different. Even for a human, it takes quite a bit of thinking to realize that these are actually the same place. So this is a, another set of images from that same data set, but shown statically on a slide. The top left image shows a particular place in the environment, which we call place A, and this is during sunny conditions. The image below it on the left hand side of the slide is that same place in, in the middle of the night during a th tropical thunderstorm. And we've labeled this A dash. So A and A dash are the same place. If you look at the second column of images, this shows the original place A, it's the same place, and a different place in the environment called place B. Now place A and place B are from completely different locations, but you can see that they superficially look extremely similar. Now most computer vision and robotic vision approaches to navigation consist of a feature extraction step where they look at small parts of the image and extract some form of feature, whether it be corners or edges or little gradient parts of the images and so forth. If you look at individual patches in these two images, image A and image B, which are from different places, you can see that there are very similar features in similar locations in the image, yet these are actually different places. And this is the essence of the problem that we're trying to address with the work I'm presenting in this talk that in many situations where perceptual change is extreme, features can be quite unreliable. The approach taken in the research I'm talking about today is motivated by some observations about limitations of current feature-based techniques. First of all, is there an everything invariant feature that you can detect in an image? So that would be a feature which is detectable no matter what the environmental conditions what time of day it is, what the weather is, or what season it is. And as of make the making of this presentation, there's no feature detector which comes close to that. So in our approach, instead of relying on features, we use a whole of image approach that foregoes feature detection. So we process low resolution entire images, but don't actually extract features from them. The next observation which has motivated the approach in this work is that some places are visually ambiguous no matter what processing methodology you're using. There are always places in the environment which you can't uniquely identify based off just one visual snapshot of the place, whether you're using features or not. So the approach in this work and indeed in many existing approaches to navigation and map making is to localize using sequences of images. And this, as I mentioned before, is implicit in many probabilistic approaches, systems such as RATSLAM and some extensions to the FabMap system. So this simple set of schematics describes the core idea of the approach that Sequence SLAM takes. The majority of current place recognition or localization techniques look at what the robot or the camera is currently seeing and try and find globally, so within everything that the camera or the robot has ever seen before, try and find the best matching candidate for that image. 
What we do is we take whatever image comparison algorithm you're using and we force it to find strong matching candidates within every local section of route that the camera or the robot has ever traversed. So instead of finding one global candidate match, we make the algorithm find lots and lots of candidate matches, making sure that every local sequence has a strong candidate match within it. Now, of course, this is going to by itself result in a lot of false positives. So what we do is run a second step where we try and match or find spatially or temporally coherent sequences of what I like to call these local best matches. So in this schematic here, we have in the first sequence or very short sequence, a tree, a house, and an elephant. And then at some later time, the camera or the robot might see another tree, another house, and another elephant. Now these are just short sub-sequences within the entire experience of the camera or the robot. And what we do is when we traverse sequence two, we force whatever image comparison algorithm we're using to find a candidate match within that short sequence one. So even though the trees look different, if we forcing the algorithm to find the best match candidate, it's still probably gonna match to the tree in sequence one. The same for the house and the same for the elephant. We're forcing it to find local best matches. This animation shows it the process in a little more technical detail. So the x-axis or horizontal axis is labeled with the frame number. So as we travel along the x-axis, we're progressing through a video or through a data set. The vertical or y-axis shows all the or corresponds to all the images that the robot or the camera has seen before. So as we progress through time or progress through the frames in a video, we compare the current video to, or the current video frame to every past video frame that has ever been seen. And this generates a difference column. So a column in this picture of different scores showing how closely the current image matches to all the past frames that the robot has seen or the camera has seen. And we continue to do this as we process or progress through the video until we form what we call an image difference matrix. The next step we do is to force or the force or make sure that the image difference matrix has lots of strong candidate matches within any local section of sequence. So in this case, we're forcing it to have as you move downwards, so as you look down a column in this difference matrix, we're forcing it to have lots and lots and lots of strong candidate matches. And a strong candidate match in this case corresponds to a image comparison with a low difference score, because if there's not much difference, the images are similar. So that's what this step does. And you can see that we now have some very dark squares corresponding to very low difference scores, which means very strong matches. And if you go down any particular column in this difference matrix, you can see that there are several strongly matching candidate matches. You can also see overall that there seems to be a spatially coherent diagonal through the matrix of low difference scores, or in other words, closely matching image pairs. So the next step is to find spatially or temporally coherent sequences of these local best matches. So in this case, we do a very simple linear search through the matrix and we try and find paths or sequences through the matrix, which consist of lots and lots of local best matches. And that's how we find a matching short sequence within our entire data set. To test the algorithm, we performed two sets of experiments. We obtained video data from two independent loops of the famous or world famous racing circuit, the Nürburgring, located in Germany, which is about 22 kilometers long. And we also acquired a data set in Brisbane, Australia, driving around a set of suburban streets. And you would have seen a video of this earlier in the presentation. So the images, the four images at the left of this slide show screen grabs 
from two different YouTube videos we obtained off the net of racing circuits of the Nürburgring. And this shows the pre-processing we performed on the images. So what we did do is we cropped the two different videos to roughly corresponding fields of view using a rectangular crop. We didn't do any other camera calibration. We did not do undistortion. So you can see in the crop sections in the bottom two, bottom two left images that you can see that there's quite a bit of distortion in the left image, but not in the right. We made no attempt to compensate or deal with this distortion. For the Brisbane data set, I stuck a camera, consumer camera to the dashboard of my car, filmed through the windshield while the wipers were going and cropped out the dashboard. That was the pretty much the entire visual pre-processing that we performed. We also added some spurious extra data sets to allow or enable the algorithm to make false positive matches outside of the core data sets. So in panel A, so the top row of this slide, we have at the far right, the two YouTube videos of the Nürburgring, one grab during summer, one grab during winter. And at the left, we have two extra data sets which we threw in to process by the algorithm, which were to provide extra chances for the algorithm to make false positives. For the Brisbane day and night data set at the bottom, we chucked in two extra data sets at the beginning of Brisbane other data sets from Brisbane roads, one of them also being at night to provide extra distraction for the algorithm. There was one more step of pre-processing to provide a little bit of extra invariance to illumination. We performed patch normalization and downsampling of the images. So at the left, we have a sample image and at the right, we have the downsampled patch normalized image. Patch normalization consists of taking each pixel's intensity value, subtracting from that the mean of the surrounding pixel intensity values and then dividing by the standard deviation of the surrounding pixel intensity values. And that provides or has been shown several times to provide a bit more invariance to illumination change. And we were typically dealing with downsampled images of a few hundred to a couple of thousand pixels. And there are more details in the paper. The sequence slam algorithm requires some form of image comparison method. For these experiments, we used sum of absolute differences or SAD. So we would compare the corresponding pixels in each of these downsampled images, work out the intensity difference or the absolute intensity difference and take the mean or average of this over the entire image. And that would give us one different score. And by performing this comparison with the current image compared to all past images and doing this for every new frame that the camera processed, we were able to form that difference matrix that I showed you earlier in the presentation. And in this difference matrix, smaller SAD values indicate better matches because they represent a smaller difference between two images. This is the first of the results slide. This is a trajectory using ground truth of the Nürburgring. And everywhere there is a hollow black circle is where the system reported a correct localization match. It was able to work out where it was based off the images. And everywhere there is a small blue dot is a false negative where it wasn't able to report where it was. So it's able to localize in the majority of the data set despite the seasonal change. To provide some comparison to state of the art, we compared sequence slam on this data set with what is the golden standard in place recognition algorithms in robotics at the moment, FabMap. Now, to make the comparison a little fairer, we did feed in the original full resolution images into FabMap. We didn't feed in 1000 pixel images. However, it should be noted that the YouTube videos that we processed were fairly poor quality. So it really isn't the sort of data that a feature-based system is designed to deal with. And of course, we selected this data, this data set on purpose. We wanted a data set where feature-based techniques would really struggle. So this is a precision recall curve for sequence slam, which can achieve about 60% recall at 100% precision. Uh, and then with the open FabMap implementation of FabMap, uh, the system really struggles 
pretty much entirely because the feature-based front end of the system isn't able to report consistent feature-based matches. These are some sample frame matches for the Nürburgring dataset. So at the left is the current image and at the right is the recalled image or recognized image. And you can see from some of these frames that in the left-hand image, it's nearing winter. So a lot of the trees don't have leaves on them or the foliage is a very different color. You can also see that the cars in the two different data sets did run different racing lines. But the system was able to report matches using these short sequence matches, about 60% of the data set was matched without any errors. These trajectory plots show the precision recall performance of Open Fab Map and Sequence Slam on the second much more challenging Brisbane day-night clear weather to rainy weather data set. So at the left, Everywhere there is a red cross is where OpenFabMap reported a false positive match. There are a couple of true positive matches, but because of the difficulty of matching features across such extreme perceptual change, the system is pretty much non-functional. At the right is the sequence land performance. So everywhere there is a hollow green circle is where it reported a correct localization. So in this case, at 100% precision, so only without making any mistakes at all. Sequence Slam is only able to localize to within about 35% of the data set, uh, but it is able to do that without making any mistakes. This precision recall curve is the corresponding performance curve for the second experiment. And you can see that Sequence Slam is able to get up to about 35% at 100% precision before gradually dropping off in precision at higher recall levels. And Open Fab Map is pretty much non-functional just because the features look so different. In this video, we come full circle back to the video I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. So what you're seeing here is the output of the sequence slam localization algorithm reporting that two places are the same and we're using that information to synchronize the two videos of the environment at, under the very different perceptual conditions. So as the video fades in and out, one way of convincing yourself it's the same place of the world is to look at the street lights. And you can see that they transform from glowing yellow balls at night to gray aluminum balls during the day. And that gives you an example of the sort of degree of feature-based change. Unless you have some very sophisticated semantic reasoning in the back of your algorithm, you're not going to be able to recognize that this yellow ball of fire is the same as this bland gray blob. That's the degree of change that is present in situations like this. So to summarize the sequence slam algorithm, it consists of two major components. First of all, we force whatever image comparison algorithm you're using to find local best match image candidates within every short sequence that the camera or robot or vehicle has ever traversed. And then what we do is we try and find spatially coherent sequences of these local best matches in order to work out matching sections of the route. The output of the system is that it enables localization under extreme perceptual change using only a cheap consumer camera through changes such as extreme illumination change that you get going from day to night, weather changes such as going from a bright sunny day to a stormy downpour of rain, and seasonal change going from summer to winter. So thank you for listening to this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to query me at that email address listed there. And I'd like to again acknowledge the Australian Research Council for funding my fellowship, which has enabled me to conduct this research.